Hello, my sweet summer children. Game of Thrones is coming to an end, and now our watch is ending. But before we say goodbye to the television series that conquered pop culture and catapulted Westeros to the top of the charts, I have linked up with a plethora of other YouTubers, and we are going to give you the best of Thrones, which is our pick of our favorite episode ever of Game of Thrones. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. First of all, do you know how hard it is to pick one episode as your favorite? It's hard. Try it. You'll see. Game of Thrones has a plethora of scenes and episodes that are so epically Game of Thrones. Baylor when Ned Stark loses his head and all the events of Game of Thrones really kick into high gear. So, Ellen. Bring me his head. Fire and blood when Daenerys births her dragons. And now his watch has ended when Daenerys gives Drogon a Valyrian command and we see the true meaning of fire and blood. The Battle of the Blackwater where Tywin and Loras Tyrell come in at the last minute and save the day. Kiss by Fire where Jaime Lannister confides his real truth about the Mad King to Brienne in the bath at Harrenhal. By what right does the buff it's so hard to pick one episode but there is there is one episode that i think is the best it truly captures the badassery of game of thrones and it doesn't have the high stakes big battle scenes or the spectacle it's just old school classic game of thrones capturing the narrative and setting all the character arcs up that won't pay off for many many years to come character development is one of my favorite parts of game of thrones and the episode i chose is is one that captures that beginning of some of these amazing arcs. This episode captures the politics or the Game of Thrones and the White Walkers. It has everything and it has what I have thought is one of the most underrated scenes of Thrones. The episode I'm going to talk to you about today is Game of Thrones Season 2 Episode 10 Valar Magulis. Valar Magulis. Valar Magulis. Let me tell you why this is one of the best episodes of Game of Thrones. It's the turning point, the catalyst episode for so many things to come. The episode opens with Tyrion. Tyrion's wounded and he's got his wounds fighting to save King's Landing, but not from any of Stannis' soldiers. His own sister gave the order, or so Varys said, to have him killed. We know that Tyrion saved the city. We know that if Tyrion had never done his wildfire trick or led the charge to fight the Baratheon soldiers on the beaches of King's Landing, the city would have fallen. And what reward did Tyrion get for it? His own sister tried to kill him. He went from the Hand of the King, sleeping in the Tower of the Hand, to a wounded soldier moved to some new cramped quarters with bandages on his face and his family not even visiting him. Not that he wants them to. And Pycelle just finds all of this amusing. This scene sets up that tension between Tyrion and Tywin that will play out for a few seasons to come. We know that Tyrion was the savior of the city, but in contrast, the next Next scene, which I think is just so highly underrated, Tywin, big bad Tywin on his horse. And his horse just takes a big giant shit on the floor of the Red Keep. And the camera pans up from the shit to Tywin. The reins of Castamere is playing and Tywin rides his horse into the throne room and Joffrey hails him the savior of the city and hand of the king. It's one of the best scenes of Game of Thrones because the way Tywin is treated versus how Tyrion is treated for both having equally saved the city is so Game of Thrones. Also, we cut from Tyrion to Tywin basically shitting on him, which is what's been going on Tyrion's whole entire life. It's just like when Tywin rides in, you know you can feel that shit is about to change in King's Landing. Tywin is about to secure this crazy boy king and the throne he sits on, and it fills you with dread. 
Then we have more Game of Thrones being played. We have Peter Baelish, who has brought the Tyrells over to the Lannister side. This is all just a show for people in the court. Tywin had already consented to Marjorie and Joffrey's marriage, or the Tyrell army wouldn't be there in the first place. And all of this stuff that we're seeing is just a form of court. It, Lord Baelish and Cersei and Pycelle, all of this stuff is just for show. Littlefinger arranged all of this, and for that, he was granted Harrenhal. Sansa is relieved that she doesn't have to marry Joffrey, but in comes Littlefinger assuring her Joffrey won't let you go he doesn't give away his toys but don't worry sweet bird I will save you and get you home this is the start of Sansa's real relationship with Littlefinger this is when Sansa Stark becomes Littlefinger's prodigy look around you we're all liars here and every one of us is better than you this episode also is the start of Jamie Lannister's redemption arc, or not, and also the romance between Brienne and Jamie. Jamie has been released by Catelyn Stark, and Brienne is escorting him to King's Landing in hopes to exchange him for Sansa and Arya. Jamie Lannister and Brienne romping through the Riverlands is classic thrones in this episode their journey is really just beginning and it won't be long before the kingslayer develops a conscience we are literally seeing the most wholesome knight of the seven kingdoms in brienne and then there's jamie a knight who has forsaken every vow he's ever taken but this is the beginning of a journey that ultimately ends in redemption and love or not then we have rob stark the king in the north there are many reasons Robb Stark lost the War of Five Kings, but this episode highlights the biggest one love. Rob Stark chose love over duty and honor. It is in this episode that Rob Stark makes the fateful decision to break the oath he swore to Walder Frey. It is what Rob does in this episode that leads to the Red Wedding. Rob Stark marries Talisa even though he's promised to another. This is the catalyst for the Red Wedding. With Game of Thrones, what makes it so good, for me anyway, is we have these setup episodes with no spectacle, just all plot and moving the plot and just dialogue and they all set up and lead to some grand spectacle. And that's Game of Thrones. And this episode does so much of that, especially for the Red Wedding. On Dragonstone, in the chamber of the Painted Table, Melisandre and Stannis are coping with losing the Battle of the Blackwater. Up until now, Stannis has been seen as this brooding man that never shows emotion, but now he's dealing with defeat, and he's so angry and also so disgusted with himself that he almost kills Melisandre. He's dealing with the fact that he's murdered Renly, his own brother. Honorable Stannis murdering his brother with blood magic. He can't even control himself in the moment he's so angry, ashamed, and sad. He's just going through so many emotions. He betrayed who he is to kill his brother, but it's in the same scene that Melisandre sets up the vicious burning of his own daughter. Melisandre and Stannis look into the flames, but before that, she tells him, This war has just begun. You will betray the men serving you. You will betray your family. You will betray everything you once held dear. In Winterfell, Theon is dealing with his choices. A lot of Theon's arc is showing right here. It's laid on the table. He has like an identity crisis and he doesn't know where he belongs. He doesn't feel like he belongs in Winterfell. He went home to the Iron Islands and didn't feel like he belonged there. He's just having an identity crisis and he turns on the Starks. And Maester Lewin tells Theon, this is not you. And we know now that it's not. You're not who you're pretending to be. We know that he wasn't. And many, many seasons after this episode it all goes back here theon redeems himself at the heart tree in winterfell protecting the very boy he had taken winterfell from and he stands right in the same place where maester lewin died i mean you just can't get much more poetic than that speaking of maester lewin dying Maester Lewin dies in this episode and Bran, Rickon, Hodor, and Osha emerge from the crypts and find him wounded at the heart tree. This is the beginning of Bran's journey to find the Three-Eyed Raven and eventually become the Three-Eyed Raven. And when they are leaving and Winterfell is burning, it harks back perfectly to a quote from Clash of Kings and it gives me the chills every time. At the edge of the wolf's wood, Bran turned in his basket for one last glimpse of the castle that had been his life. 
Wisps of smoke still rose into the gray sky, but no more that might have risen from Winterfell's chimney on a cold autumn afternoon. Soot stains marked some of the arrow loops, and here and there a crack or a missing merlin could be seen in the curtain wall, but it seemed little enough from the distance. Beyond, the top of the keeps and towers still stood as they had for hundreds of years, and it was hard to tell that the castle had been sacked and burned at all. The stone is strong, Bran told himself. The roots of the trees go deep, and under the ground the kings of winter sit their thrones. So long as those remained, Winterfell remained. It was not dead, just broken, like me, he thought. I'm not dead either. In this episode, this is the beginning of Bran's journey beyond the wall. We all know what Bran winds up becoming. This this episode, it's just like a, a transformation. It's just like a transformational start episode. Like everyone starts their individual hero journeys. It is in this episode that Arya is given the coin from Jack and, and taught the words Valamogulis. This coin she will put in her pocket and it's so so important to where her story ultimately goes. She won't use the coin until the very end of season four, but this is where Jacken shows her he can change his face and she can learn how to do it too in Bravos. And eventually she does go to Bravos and it leads to some very significant kills to say the least. This episode is a major turning point for almost every character. Daenerys is in Karth. Her dragons have been taken from her and she goes to the house of the Undying. It is here that she gets the vision of the throne room covered in snow and ruined, which is likely what the Red Keep looks like now. She also reunites with her husband and son in a dream, but ultimately it's the first time that she uses her dragons to kill. This is the first time she uses the Dracarys command. The first chains that the Breaker of Chains ever breaks are her own, and she leaves Karth for Slaver's Bay to trample slave nations into the dust. This is the episode that really hurls John into the north with the wildlings. He kills Corrin Halfhand and infiltrates the wildlings, and Egret is sold. And we are the watches on the wall. And the relationship between John and Igret and John and the Wildlings starts here. He's accepted and he's off to meet the king beyond the wall, Mance Raider. And at the very end of the episode, Gren, Ed, and Sam are beyond the wall in the snowy vastness of the north and hear three blasts for White Walkers. And we see the Whites and the White Walkers appear on dead horses. And this is the best the White Walkers have ever looked. The mist trailing behind him, him being barefoot and basically naked is so much more book accurate. Yeah, they do have camouflage armor in the books or a magical armor, but right here they are almost directly depicted as Will describes them in the prologue of A Game of Thrones. Then he speaks a command that sounds like cracking ice and we see the undead army marching right for the fist of the first men and boom, the episode ends. And what an episode it is. That's classic Game of Thrones. That's Game of Thrones at its best. That's the best of Thrones. At this time, I would like to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. If you don't know what Squarespace is, it's an all-in-one platform that allows you to create your own website or online store. I'm using it now to create the website for the Obsidian Knights podcast. They have modern templates that are crafted by Squarespace's world-class design team. They have a Facebook integration and easy importing you can pull in content from Twitter, Instagram, Foursquare, and others directly into any page, sidebar, or footer of your site. You can present videos from your YouTube, Venmo, or Animoto while maintaining your website style using video blocks with custom image overlay. Seriously, I'm bad at computers, so it's easy. If I can do it, you can do it. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to www.squarespace.com slash gray area for 10% off your first purchase. The link will be in the description box. But what is your favorite episode of Game of Thrones and why? I encourage you to make a video about it, share your Best of Thrones experience with the world, and if not, just tell me in the comments. Also, don't forget to check out all of the other awesome content creators that I collab with that picked out their Best of Thrones. The playlist will be linked below. As always, thanks for watching. Thanks to everyone that supports me on Patreon. If you like Shame. this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please click that Shame. subscribe button, hit that notification bell, Shame. and join the Sweet Summer family. Shame. Okay.
Okay, my sweet summer children, Shame. have a good day. Shame. Shame.